Okay. So today we're going to do the immunity part two. Uh, we're going to talk about the <clears throat> difference between the cellular immunity and humoral immunity. You guys tell me what's the main difference. What is cellular? What is humoral? Humoral is in the fluid. And cellular, what's directly towards the cells. No? Okay. Uh, which type of cells are the ones that do the humoral immunity? For humoral, it will be B. And for right. cellular, it will be T. So. Got it. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So you already know that part. Uh, we're going to talk about the two forms of active immunity and passive immunity. This we haven't talked about. So basically, what's the difference between active and passive? Uh, we're also going to talk about the four uh, general properties of immunity. Uh, four major types of T cells, which are these T cells, guys. What are these four major types of T cells? Cytosics, uh, helpers, cytotoxic, suppressors, what else? Uh, one person at a time. Hello? Natural killers. And NK cells. Okay, so that means you already know that part. We're going to talk about the mechanism of antigen presentation. Uh, which are the cells that we talked already that do antigen presentation? Uh, guys, you have to enable it. I haven't muted anybody, so you should be able to hear me. So turn on the, the speaker volume. That's what I can say. Okay, so uh, which are the ones that do antigen presentation? What type of cells that we talked about already that do antigen presentation? IgM. Um T helper. Well, the main ones that do the antigen presenting cells are going to be the macrophage. We talked about this already. So antigen presenting cells, mainly macrophages. They're going to engulf, they're going to eat any cellular debris, and then they're going to present the antigen, which is on the surface, to the T helpers, the natural killer cells, or any other cell. We're also going to talk about the activation. So when you present the antigen, you are going to be activating the receptors on either a T cell or on a B cell. So mostly these receptors that we talked about, the CD8 and CD4, is just referring to receptors on the T cell end. So we are presenting the antigen to the T cells and you are activating these receptors on the T cell end. Describe the structure of antibodies, right? So we're going to talk about the antibodies. You already know that antibodies have what? Antigen determinant sites. That they have a three-dimensional shape, and each antigen has a different shape. This is known as recognition sites. That's where the antibody will be recognized by the receptors from the T-cell. What receptors? CD8, CD4. And we also want to talk about the difference between primary and secondary immune response. Okay, who mediates the primary immune response? And we did this already. Primary immune response by what type of B-cells? Oh, B cells, no, I'm sorry. Uh, what type of immunoglobulins? Who does primary? IgM. IgM. Who does secondary? IG what? IG? G? IgG. So secondary or memory, that's the response on the B cell end from the immune system. 
I'm sorry, the antibodies. So let's go into details. The lymphoid system and the body, it has two defenses. So these defense can be either a non-specific or they can be what? Specific defense. If you have a specific defense, it means that you're going to make a receptor or an antibody that binds to a specific antigen recognition site. What does that mean? That that specific antigen, it needs to be recognized by your immune system. So let's put it this way. This is your antigen and it has a different end here. So that's the antigen. You need to make a recognition receptor, which is the one that I'm drawing right now, the one that is bolded, that needs to recognize the antigen. So this is going to be the receptor or antigen recognition okay so this is the other antigen end so that's specific the non-specific means what you don't create anything for that antigen per se but you have a set of rules already set in your body that you're born with and that is your physical barriers like your skin your mucous membrane your stomach acids your tears, phagocytes, the immunological surveillance cells. Which are the surveillance cells, guys? Which ones are the surveillance cells? The T cells. No, I, uh, the NK NK cells. Cells. Now, also interference. Interference, they interfere with what? this last class viral replication so in other words it prevents the virus from actually entering the cell or replicating within it mainly entering the cell complement a complement is a group of proteins that are going to stimulate inflammatory response so stimulate inflammation and they as well are going to amplify. They're going to amplify what? The recognition. What does that mean? If you have this antigen in your body and you start putting a lot of complement around it, this seems to be what? It's getting what now? What's the word that we use when you have too many things in one place or too many people in one place? Crowded. So as the complement binds to that antigen, is crowding it, is making that bigger, a bigger event to be recognized. So it's going to help amplify the recognition of the antigen end and at the same time is going to help call in some help into that area, it means T's or B cells. We also have the inflammatory response, and then of course, fever. Fever, we said the fever was caused by a chemical known as what? A pyrogen, correct? So pyrogen is the one that causes the fever or induces fever in the body. So now we talked about the specific versus non-specific. So specific is what? T's or B cells. The rest is just what? Non specific, including what? Natural killers. That is non specific. So, how do they interact? We said that they don't work separately. B's don't do something that T's doesn't do. They work in collaboration. So, let's say, for example, you have an antigen. Step one. And then this antigen is going to trigger. A response hopefully so that response the first thing response that you have in your body is going to be the non-specific which is your skin and here you go your natural killer cells if it's in your skin uh, or your mucus 
which is the release of IgA, uh, which is on the stomach, which is uh, hydrochloric acid denaturation or natural killer cells, they're going to start destroying this antigen or this bacteria or this protein or this DNA, right? Whatever is something that is foreign. As you encounter this, you get into a war and in that fight, there's gonna be what? A bunch of debris left around. So this debris is gonna be engulfed by what? The macrophage. So macrophage is gonna engulf all this debris here and is going to try to digest the debris. So far so good. Yes. Yeah, I, all right. At the same time, what is making this antigen pop out? So the body knows for sure that there is an infect agent inside our body. That is complement. So on top of the cell debris or cellular debris, okay, you have the antigen. I don't know, let me just draw an antigen here, something like that. This is your antigen, and the antigen is going to be crowded by complement all around it. The complement is going to do the following. One, it's going to stimulate, we said, inflammation. So you can have, you can send out chemo taxes or chemo atrophic agents. Okay? These agents are going to call in what? T's and B cells, neutrophils, any white blood cells. At the same time, this complement is going to help the recognition of the antigen. <clears throat> So now, since this helps recognize the antigen, the T's or B cells or any white blood cells are capable of binding. And now they're able to do what? Destroy it. And by destroying means what? Cellular debris. So who's binding? In this case, according to this table, natural killers. Okay, so natural killers. And of course, you're also going to have your neutrophils, which are the first line of defense. Okay, which are macrophages. So these guys are the ones who are going to destroy and they're going to create cellular debris. Then the macrophages comes into play. Is this happens in a proper order? Okay, guys, all these things are happening at the same time. It means that if the macrophage sees any debris, it's gonna eat it up. If the complement recognizes any antigen, it's gonna to bind to it. If a natural killer finds an antigen without a complement and is able to recognize, the natural killer will bind to it and they will kill it automatically. Is that clear? Yes. So either natural killer binds or neutrophils bind or any white blood cell binds to it and it's going to kill it. Now, if you have complement, it's just going to help you in all the following events that we talked about. Okay? So now we have the cellular debris. Then the macrophages are going to eat it. And now these macrophages, if they cannot digest the content or the antigen in this case, they become now an antigen-presenting cell. So when they present the antigen, what does that mean? That they are going to stimulate, they are going to stimulate or activate, hopefully a immune or greater immune response. So which is that big immune response? That cell that we're talking about is going to be what? The T helper cell. T helpers have a specific receptor. That receptor is known as CD4. Natural killers have CD8. A 
Again, this is just a receptor on the surface. Are you guys on the same boat? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So once the T cells, uh, T helper cells are being stimulated, what's going to happen? T cell is going to activate T's proliferation to make more T cells, or in this case, not to make more, I'm sorry, to call in for reinforcement. So they're going to call in. Call in means what? You're going to release interleukins. Which are going to ask for more T helper, I mean T cells to that area. At the same time, the T helper is going to call in for reinforcement on the B cell and so interleukins, the same thing. So in other words, you have activation of T's, and at the same time, you have activation of what? B cells. B cells. If a T cell is able to recognize, so one of those T memories that you have, right? Remember you have T cytotoxics, T suppressors, T helpers. So if the T cytotox is able to bind it, that means you have some sort of memory and you can right away go ahead and kill it. Or of course, the natural killers, right? So these guys kill and this is your memory. So suppressors and helpers, basically they do not tend to kill anything, suppresses just suppresses the activation of T's and helpers just calling for help for most of the time. So on the B cell end, what's going to happen? You stimulate your B cells and you got to call in for what? You're going to check the memory, see if you have what on the B cell end. So this is T cells. So what on the B cell do we have? Well, Ig what? Igg or memory. So if there's any memory or if there's any previous infection that is the same thing as this one, you got no problem. You're going to have plenty of IgGs and you're going to clone them. If that is your first time you get exposed to that antigen, to that bacteria, then you depend mainly on what? IgM, which is the ones that mediate your primary infection. If one of those five arms binds to the antigen and recognize it, then you clone that arm into a new what? IgG or IgA. Let me put those things. So one, two, three, four, five. So one arm is like this, the other one's like that, all the other one like this, uh, this one's like that, and this one is, I don't know, like that. So let's say our antigen is a circle. So which of the arms are going to bind to it? Arm one, two, three, four, or five? Which arm is going to bind to the antigen, which is a circle? This is the antigen. One. One. So that means that we know that this IgM did it. And it was capable to recognize with one arm the antigen. So what are we going to do? We're going to get that antigen. I'm sorry, that <clears throat> that uh, arm, in this case, that receptor, and we're going to make copies. <clears throat> so this copy means what? We're going to start to make more of these by cloning the same arm and creating later on our memory, the IgG. So this is now is capable of binding to any antigen and fight our infection, so now we are able to kill all that bacteria and all those antigens. Hence, creating more debris, right? More macrophages, more antigen presenting cells, and more white blood cells activation until there's no more debris and there's no more antigens in our bloodstream or in our body. So it's a circle, in other words. So far, so good? Yeah. So this section right here that says, maturation class cells and production of antibodies that's what you're doing you recognize first one right you stimulate your plasma cell which is, again is a b cell that is on the bloodstream and then that plasma cell is going to create more copies of the same type okay 
on the other hand, on the T cell it says production of memory T cells. If you already recognize one, either by having memory already or by a other recognition, you're going to stimulate your T cells to go to the thymus, and this thymus is going to mature the T cells, and you're going to make more cytotoxic T cells, hence more what? Memory. So now, what have you done? You have fought the infective organism, you successfully clear all the antigen and cell debris, and you came out with a T memory cell and a what? A B memory cell for the rest of your life. Better? Yeah. No? Yes. Yes. So again, you already know what innate is. Innate is that you're born with it, correct? So it's found or present at birth. Adaptive immunity, we talked about it. Adaptive immunity can be, well, adaptive immunity is based on what? T's and B cells, correct? This is the one that you adapt, that you create new things. So this adaptive immunity can be either active or passive. So what is active? That means that you get the actual infective agent, the antigen. You get the infection, you get the virus, you get the bacteria, you get the protozoa, whatever. You get the actual infection. So you get a full exposure, a life exposure. Let's put this life. The life exposure, so a life bacteria or, or uh, antigen. On the passive immunity, you still are creating memory, but this passively means that the person received the antibody that is being created outside the body. So an active immunity, your body gets the infective agent, and your own body creates the antibodies. On the passive immunity, what do you get? You receive the antibody. So active, your body makes the antibody. Passively, you get it. From where? From either a person or an animal. For example, if you are a newborn and you get exposure of a bacterial infection, what do you have as a newborn in your bloodstream that is from your mom? What type of immunoglobulins? IgG. Remember, this goes through the placenta. So that means even as a newborn, you have memory from mama. So that's an example of passive immunity because your body did not make the IgG. Mama gave it to you. Okay? On the animals, we're going to talk about the horse serum, uh, which is basically the antivenoms that we tend to generate. So active versus natural, I'm sorry, active versus passive immunity. So active, we said is what? Your body makes the, so exposed to the antigen and your body makes it. On passive, immunity means what? That you receive the antibody that is on someone else. So active can be either natural or artificial. When we talk about natural means is what? Is that you get the actual infective agents. So you get exposed to the bacteria. On an artificial, this is what we know as what? Your vaccines, immunization or vaccination. So in the vaccines, you get a portion, not the whole thing, you get a portion of a virus a protein, a piece, uh, a portion of the capsid, uh, you get a portion of the DNA or the clay acids into your body so you can trigger a immune response so that way you have memory to prevent any further infection or greater infection later on in life. So do you understand the difference between natural acquired and artificial? Mm 
Yes. Okay, so vaccines. Passive immunity, on the other hand, is that it's already made for you, the antibody. So naturally or artificial. Naturally means that it's made in a human body. So if it makes it in the human body, is the one that comes from mama, is the one that crosses the placenta, is the one that you get from the milk. So crossing the placenta is IgG, getting from the milk of mom is IgA. So these are the main two antibodies that you get naturally from mom. The artificial one means that it's not made inside a human, so most likely this is done by some either some other person and or animal. So the example is the rabies and the snake venoms. It's called the uh, horse serum, which means we infect or we inject the venom of a snake, a rattlesnake, and we put it in a horse. Uh, the horse, of course, the horse is going to create a new response and is going to make antibodies or pig is going to make antibodies against that venom. What's the outcome of the horse? Life or death? Life. Death. The horse will die because the venom works too fast. So, yes, we sacrifice either horse or pig, but now since we have this venom, we can do a couple of things. One, we can save multiple lives. Okay. Two, we can clone. Okay, we can clone these antibodies. So there's gotta be one sacrifice, then we are going to use this for a longer period of time and save a bunch of lives. So far, so good. You guys don't like the sacrifice part? But does the horse die from, from rabies or no? Uh, the horse most likely is going to die from rabies. I'm actually, I was talking about sling venom. Okay. So sling yeah. Venom, sling venom, 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 venom. yeah. I mean, if the horse is infected with rabies, yeah, most likely it will die. But I was okay. mainly referring to the sling venom. It's, it's a really fast acting venom. So here are the forms of immunity. I put that in a table where we talk about it, so let's review it. So I need immunity is the one that you are born with it. So you need no prior exposure, you're born with this. These are your barriers. Adaptive immunity is mediated by either T's or B's, and you are produced an antigen that based on an antigen exposure. You produce antibodies or memory cells. So that can be Active or passive? Active is that you're exposed to the antigen. Passively is that you get it from another source. If you do it actively, it means either you get the infective agent, okay? That means you produce your own antibodies, so you get the bacteria, you get the infection, or it can be induced, means what? Is your antibody that was created from a vaccine. So you induce with a portion or a fraction. Okay, fraction or a portion of a virus or bacteria. Okay, natural is you get the full thing. So on the passive immunity is from the outside source, is not made in your body, the antibodies. So naturally is that you get it from mother, you get IgG and IgM. IgG is for the one that goes to the placenta, IgA is the one that's found on breast milk, a mom. That's why it's important to lactate. And then we have the induced passive immunity, which is the antibodies. Okay. So nowadays, I believe we're going away from sacrifice. We just get the venom from the snake. 
and that venom is going to get exposed uh, to a series of uh, B cells. These B cells, a lot of them are going to fail, but others are going to create the antibodies. And once you have that, you can clone them as many times as you want to. So that's no problem. So, so um, a, a, a bone marrow donation, would that be induced active immunity? No, the bone marrow, you don't get any antibodies from the bone marrow. The bone marrow, all you get is the capacity or the ability to create new white blood cells, red blood cells on platelets. Gotcha. Okay. You're getting the stem cells. In other words, you're getting the stem cells. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So you're not getting the actual antibodies. So stem cells means that these cells don't do a lot. They are able to create the white blood cells, red blood cells, or platelets. We don't know which white blood cell, we don't know which red blood cell, we don't know what, kind, what type of platelets. <clears throat> but that's what you get from the bone marrow, the stem cells. The capacity to regenerate. Your body, of course, will tend to create their own whites, their own reds, and their own platelets. Of course, the donor needs to be compatible with your group. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. So even though the white blood cells are here on the bone marrow, yeah, you're not transferring white blood cells per se. You're transferring the stem cells, the, the pluripotent cells. So you get exposed to the antigen. The plasma cells have a receptor, they bind to the antigen, and that's how you're going to elicit a immune response. So this is now the activation, or, and then the amplification of the immune response. So number two is the versatility. The body is able to produce a lot of different type of what? Lymphocytes. Many varieties. You don't know which antigens. You have to create hundreds of thousands of different ones of them. So see in which one is able to properly fight or recognize that antigen. Once you found or the right antibody is capable of binding to that antigen, then what do you do next? You clone it. So the active lymphocyte, let's say this is the only one that bound to it. This is known as the active lymphocyte. And what are you going to do to it? You're going to clone it. Why? Because that's the only one that recognizes the antigen. So you can clone the same one. So now you can fight that specific antigen, means that only that antigen. So far so good? Or you're lost here. Guys. So far so good. So good. Number three, you now you're cloning, now you have the antigen recognized by a either a T cytotoxic or an IgG. What happens next? Well, you fight. And as you fight, you create cellular debris. And as you create cellular debris, you create more macrophages. You call in more web cells until everything is clear. At the end, what do you want to do? Do you want to keep every single one of those T cytotoxins and IgGs that you cloned? So normally during an infective AI, the infection, you get hundreds of millions of these things, T cytotoxins and IgGs. If you were to keep all of them, so a million of white blood cells in your body for every infection that you have for about 30 years old, how much of these guys would you have? How is your blood? How will be your blood if you don't eliminate them? The blood is going to be what? 
crowded, correct? So your blood yeah, is yeah. thick. Yeah. So that means you don't keep all these immunoglobulins. You only keep the ones that worked and only a few of them. So that means when you keep only a few and the rest you destroy, this is that you are keeping what? Memory. So far, so good. Yeah. So B cell end or T cell end? B cell, memory cell. T cells, memory cell. Live for years, years. So you have an antibody production, which are the B cells, the plasma cells that create antibodies for that specific antigen, since you already have memory. And then you have the cellular immune response, which is you have your specific T cytotoxins for years. After a few years, what happens? You kill them and you make a clone of the same. So you keep the same memory throughout life. Okay? Do you get it or not? Yes. Yeah. So all we're talking about here is guys saving space. If we have a lot of dead white blood cells, a lot of dead TC cells lying around our body for about 30, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, then your cell, your bloodstream, your tissues are going to be crowded. So you need to eliminate and create new. So you only keep a few. So we're trying to save space here. So the next step is what? We create a memory. The next step is tolerance. A tolerance, what does that mean? When you tolerate someone, when you tolerate certain things, it means that you're capable to cope with things that you sometimes don't really like or enjoy. So the immune system tolerance means ignoring. Ignoring what? What your normal antigens are. What is a normal antigen? Inside each cell that you have, you have receptors. Okay, and these receptors tends to be what? Self. Self means is part of your body. So these self receptors, this group is known as MHC, major histo compatibility complex. What a complex. Uh, this is a complex, right? It's a group of cells recognized antigens or receptors. So that means that this MACs is what tells your immune system that is part of your body. So if you belong to this complex, to the MAC complex, that is, are the normal receptors and our antigens that says that D cell is self or part of your body. Okay? You guys get the MACs? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so MACs, part of cells. Go ahead. I just have a silly question maybe. Why would it be called an antigen then? Because isn't that something that's foreign uh, from the body? Why would it be called an antigen if it's part of your body? Uh, because even though it's part of your body, your body recognizes. So your body recognizes the receptors, recognizes antigen. It's kind of contradictory, uh, but remember when we talked about the ABO? And if you transfuse A blood into a B blood, the receptors on the red blood cell, these were known as what? Antigens. Those are antigens. You remember? So in this case, yeah, they're antigens, but these are our own receptors, our own antigens. So it's going to be recognized as what? Self. And that is like saying you transfuse blood from A to A. It means that body is going to recognize the same receptor as what? Self. Do you follow? 
Yeah, okay, thank you. But the definition of an antigen by book is a particle that does not belong to your body, so a foreign agent. In this case, this agent is part of our body. But again, your own blood group has antigens, but that is your own antigen, self, which is no more than a receptor. It's a lot of wording for the same thing. Okay, so antigen receptor, as long as it's part of you, then that is that it belongs to self, which is part of your MAC. Okay, thank that, you. You so it's a possible trigger. It is a possible trigger. If by any chance you have here a cancer that affects the cell, this receptor may not look like self. This receptor is not going to look like this. I just put a different color so you can tell. So that means that is this now receptor is part of your body? Nope. So this now is recognized as a what? As an antigen. Correct. And now hopefully your NK cells or your neutrophils are able to recognize and what? And destroy. Destroy. Does that make sense? Even though that's your own cell because that is now a cancer cell. And now is putting on the outside a different recognition or a different MAC complex. Gotcha. So your antigen could be a possible antigen for someone else's body. Yeah, I mean, when yeah. you do transplants, oh, I'm going to talk about this later, but when you do transplant, you need to match your MACs, mm -hmm. okay? which is the Q, the P, the R. Uh, Again, it's just it's a table, and then you try to match the closest number as possible as well as your ABO. And that's when you say it's a match. If you want, I'll talk about this uh, after we finish this, okay? Well, I'll explain okay. to you. It's just matching. All right. So antibody-mediated immunity, again, you have what? You make antibodies. So hence the name antibody-mediated immunity. What do you make? Antibodies. So you have an antigen. You're exposed to your B lymphocytes, plasma cells, which are in the plasma, and they create antibodies. What do we call that? Antibody mediated immunity. That's good, right? No? Guys? Hello? Yep. All right, so the reason why we call it antibody mediated is because your body creates antibodies. The cell mediated immunity is called cell mediated because it binds directly to the cell, that is your cytotoxic T cells, and then it creates the following. Yes, it binds to the cell, but what does it do? It kills it by doing the following perforating or ground enzymes that destroy or kill the cell as well as producing interference can interfere with viral replication, so prevents the entry of the virus into the actual cell. So that's the cellular immunity. So here's the example of the cellular immunity. So you have your antigen presentation, which triggers a specific defense, immune response. Then you have your phagocytic cells, which gets activated. Again, these are your uh, Neutrophils, uh, your T cells get activated as well, then NK cells, and then these activated T cells are going to now create and attack the infective uh, agent, in this case, the antigen, to destroy it. Okay? We talked about already the antigen presenting cells, so I'm not going to go into that again. Now, what is that? What are you recognizing? Yeah, you talk about an antigen, and you said that the antigen is anything that is foreign, right? It can be a virus, it can be a bacteria, correct? It could be anything you said, as long as it's not part of my body. But what is being recognized? The whole thing? No. What you recognize on that antigen, or that virus, or that bacteria, or that infective organism, you are recognizing this, the proteins on the outside. The receptors, in other words. So what does that mean? Glycoproteins, glycosugar proteins are proteins, so it's a 
sugar protein receptor. You also have the proteoglycans, protein and glycogen. And you have your glycolipids, which is basically glycosugar and lipids are fats. So these, all these bunch of receptors are the ones that are being the flag. Uh, let me just draw a flag here. Okay, this is the flag that is now recognized by whom? This is recognized by your neutrophils and or your what? A cells. Or of course, if you have any memory memory cells. So, so those are your flags. Glycoproteins, proteoglycans, and glycolipids. Those are the flags. Okay? Or memory. So memory is TC or IgG. Are you guys following or you're lost? I'm good. Uh, you're lost? Yeah. So when you recognize someone, how do you recognize me? If you see me? How would you recognize me? Your face. Your face, because what? You already saw my face, right? Now you have memory. You have memory in the occipital, in the in the parietal lobe. So that memory tells you that you're recognizing a part of my body. You're not recognizing my whole body. You're just looking at my face. So now by looking at my face, which is again either a glycoprotein, a proteoglycan, or a glycolipid, a portion of the whole structure you are able to recognize that that is an antigen. Or in this case, you're able to recognize me. Are you guys following what a glycoprotein, proteoglycan, and glycolipid is? Is a portion of the whole antigen. So you are not recognizing the full antigen. You are recognizing actually portions of the antigen. Because you need to bind to these receptors. Better? Yes. Yes. So we talked about the ABO groups. I'm not going to go into that one, but now we're going to be more specific into what is MACs. So it says MAC is a major histocompatibility complex. Major is the majority of them. Histo is histology, so found in the cells. So histo is tissue, right? Compatible is that it's compatible with your body, so yours. Tissues. And the complex is a group. So you have a kind of different groups here. So you have MACs, which again determine the compatibility of a donor for organ transplant. So we're going to be specific now into organ transplant because at the end is a tissue recognized. So I can give you any part of my body, as long as it's recognized in your body, that is yours, you would not have any immune response because your body recognizes itself. You get it? Yes. Or not? Yes. Yeah. It's like when you get blood, can you get blood from an A group individual? Mm -hmm. If you're a blood group, yes. A, you get A. Yes. Why? Because your body is not going to mount any response or immune response against that A. It's going to be recognized as your own blood. That's why we transfuse A to A. Agree? So we're going to do the same thing on tissues. So MAC complex is a set of what? Cells, surface, they call it molecules. You guys already know that, yes, it's a molecule, but it's physically made into what? Receptors. Receptors, which are what? Glycoproteins, proteo, glycans, glycans and glycolipids. That's what they're made out of. So these receptors, yes, they're molecules assembled by these guys. OK? 
Okay. So then the MAC gene family is divided. So now you know that it's a molecule, it's a receptor actually, that you divide the family into two major classes. You either are class one, so MAC one, or you're class two, which is what? MAC twos. You guys following? So that means that this complex of glycoprotein, protoglycan, glycolipids is going to be in two classes. If you're making myself uh, confused, I really don't understand. I thought I did, now I don't. Guys, it's really simple. What you're doing is what? You're making an antibodies, recognize a what? A cell receptor. That's all we're doing. Are you guys following? Yes. So all we're talking about now is we're talking about the cell receptor. So the cell receptor is made out of a molecule built by glycoproteins, proteoglycans, or glycolipids. So if your antibodies need to recognize a cell receptor, then what are the different types or the majority, uh, the average, that we have? Two classes. HLAs, which are the class one, okay, and they can be A, B, or C. And then you have on the class two, HLA, which is HLA stand for what? H is for what? What are you? Human. Human. L for what? Leukocytes. Why leukocytes? Because leukocytes are what? Your white blood cells. And then A is for what? Antigen. Mm -hmm. Again, you don't need to know what HLA is. I'm just explaining to you so you understand it. I didn't understood anything until I learned what the word means. So a human means that it belongs to a human only. A leukocyte antigen means that this antigen is going to activate a white blood cell reaction in this case will be your what natural killers neutrophils or your memory cells so this is the antigen in other words that it's going to that it might be recognized by your body as self or by another body as foreign so far so good yes yes so we have the same thing hlas the difference is that these are dq dpdr and these are abc's now, I'm not going to go into detail into which one is what. Just know that which one is MHC2s, which ones are MHC1s. Now, you were asking about transplant. If we able to match the, let's say, this is the donor. The donor is someone that died, okay, or someone that is a live donor. So you have either dead, transplant, dead, or you have live. So if the person is dead or the person is alive, we go to the same thing. And then the donor, and then we have our what? Recipient. Okay? So in our recipient, we need to match what? MAC. My God. MAC1 and or MAC what? Two. Put it here on the other side. So far so good? So if the MAC1 is A122 and the MAC2 is DR54, it's just a number, it's a different series of different type of receptors. <clears throat> and then my recipient is MAC. One, A128 or two, DR53, could that be a match? As long as it's within three to 10, no, less than 10, the numbers apart, then that is a match, okay, more or less. So a 122 can match with a 128, and there are specific ones that we match, and these are these, the DQ, the R, and DP, there are more. 
So 127, 122, you want hopefully one, somebody 120 will work, but hopefully you want the same one, 122. Uh, DR54, hopefully you don't want 53. I mean, it's closing up, but you want what? 54. If that is a perfect match, which is hardly ever happens. So that means that that is a what? Match. What else do we have to match? ABO. That means we're matching the same numbers. Can you repeat that again? So we want to match. Go ahead. No, can you repeat that again, that whole process of the, of the whole matching? Okay, enable to match donor versus recipient. We need to match ABO. We need to match MHCs on and two for matching okay. tissue. ABO, same blood group. You guys already right. know the blood groups, right? So A positive, A positive. Uh, B negative, B negative. Okay. So you can always do uh, uh, what is it? The universal donor, which is what? Uh, the uh, the O group. Uh, but quick, uh, a question on that: Why would red blood cells have receptors to begin with, if their only thing, their main thing, is just to um, carry oxygen? Well, every single tissue or cell in your body has to have receptors. Because that's the only way your body can check if those cells belong to you. If they don't have any receptors, then how do you know that cell belongs to you? Okay. Does it make sense? Yeah. So everything has receptors. There's got to be a way of communicating. Let's say there's got to be a command saying, okay, uh, when the oxygen binds to the cell, uh, there's got to be a command that tells the cell to go from one place to the next place. Those commands, that chain of command, that connectivity with another cell or another chemical is done always through these cell receptors. Okay. So MEC one or two, you want to match the same, same number. That's hopefully what you want. If it's DR54, uh, you match both DR54 or really close by. Okay. As long as it's 10 numbers below. So, if it's 54 and then you have 64, uh, unless the other ones are a close match, like the DP and DQ, then yeah, that works. But if they are, I don't know, the other ones are higher than 10, then that's not a match even though you have an ABO group match. Why is this? It, I, no, I was going to ask, is there like a lot of variability in terms of like yes. the different types of like DR, DQ, DPs? Is that, that only for class? One of the numbers is a variable, yes. Okay. And that's but that's for both class one and class two, right? Correct. And there's more than A, B, and Cs. There are more. And there are more than DQ, the RDP. It's so just the most common ones on human beings. Okay. I mean, in average, I'm sorry, not human beings, in average population, I'm sorry. Of course, it's not human. So. If you were to have the same number match, you always remember that you use what after you do transplant. So after the transplants, of course, what do you give your patient for the rest of their life? Immunosuppressant. Thank you. Why do you give them immunosuppressants? To prevent organ rejection. Why do you have organ rejection? To prevent organ rejection, right? Or to inhibit organ rejection. Why would you have organ rejection at the same time? Because you're not a what? Perfect match. Do you know what a perfect match is? Both the donor and your recipient needs to be what? DR54, DQ1, DQ12, the same number. And they also have to have HLA225, uh, 235, and 540. I don't know. I'm just making these numbers right now. If they match perfectly in everything, then do you have a perfect match? You really don't need immunosuppressants. 
But then if there's a lot of variability, then that means like nobody's ever a perfect match. And like, I agree. No. And that's why we use immunosuppressant medication because nobody is a perfect match unless it's what? You, yourself, in other words. Uh, a twin. Okay? So that's why we always use immunosuppressant drugs. And every transplant is different because every matching is different. They may be closer, they may be farther apart. It just depends. So you may need more immunosuppressants, you may need less immunosuppressants. One immunosuppressant may work while others don't work. Clear. Okay. The only thing I'm asking you here is know what MACs are. Okay, what is class one and what is class two? That's it. I'm not going to ask you anything about uh, a specific transplant things that I just gave you. I'm not going to do that. Okay. So let's go into details about ABCs, antigen presenting cells. Again, these are your phagocytic cells that involve the bacteria or the antigen or a piece of the antigen. It's going to go through a lysosome. The lysosome is going to break into chunks, into little pieces. And now you have a small antigen. If you're not able to digest it, you will be presenting this antigen to the surface of that cell. So this is the surface. Have you noticed what is this called? MAC what? Protein. Mm. What is that? Major histocompatibility. You are putting the antigen on a top of a receptor in the surface of the cell. So this now becomes an MAC. Is this MAC going to be recognized as cell? Or no. not cell? Not what do you cell. Think? What is it? Non cell? Correct. Why non cell? Because that red marking right there is a what? Is an antigen. So that's what we call a what on the surface? Flag. So you're flagging, you're actually asking for what? Help. So, so who? So someone can recognize it. Who can recognize? Again, neutrophils. NK cells, maybe. Okay. So, class one and class two. Class one, they go directly on the plasma membrane. Okay. So they display the abnormal antigen. In this case is a peptide. The antigen is a peptide. On the class two, they display it again on the plasma membrane. And instead of that, this is actually a fragment. So what are the example of antigen presenting cells? That's what you need to know. So either the free macrophages or the fixed. Coffer cells in the liver were free or fixed? Fixed. Fixed because these are macrophages on the liver. Microglia, these are macrophages on the central nervous system, so these are fixed. Langerhans cells in your skin, are they fixed or free? Mm. They're fixed. 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 Dendritic cells found on the lymph nodes and spleen. Fixed. Fixed. So all these are fixed. Which are non fixed? Which are free? The microphages. Monocytes. The monocytes, which are they can migrate into the tissue, and then once they are in the tissue, we call them what? Macrophage. 
the mall size are the free ones. So they can go around the whole bloodstream for sending the antigen to the rest of the cells. So now let's go in details about the CD4, CD8, even though I presented it to you. So CD8, again, is a receptor. So they attack foreign cells, infect viruses, they are responsible for cell-mediated immunity. So which ones are found where? Again, CD4, CD8 are just what? Cellular or cell receptors. T helpers have CD4, you need to know that. And suppressor cells have what? CD8. Memory cells, which are T cytotoxins, have both. So these are no more than what? Mark proteins or marker proteins on the surface or the cell membrane. So let me summarize it and I'll give you this. Step by step. So how do we activate a CD4? Normally, you need to have a CD plus an MAC complex. Why CD? CD is on the T cells. Agreed? MAC is on your tissues. Are you, are you there? Uh, yeah. So, T cells have either CD4 or CD8, mainly. There's more. Tissues have either MAC2s or MACs1. So far, so good. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So this CD4 codes for the T cell type. This MAC codes for what? Self or non-self tissue. So how's the binding? Like this. CD4 always going to bind to MAC2s. CD8 almost always is going to bind to MAC1. At the end, you're supposed to get what? 2 times 8 gives you what? I'm sorry. 16. 2 times 4 gives you what? Oh, 8. 8. 8 times 1 gives you what? 8. eight. That's how you pair them up. CD4 always goes with 2. CD8 always goes with MAC1s. One is your body cells, I mean your tissue, and the other one is your T cells. Anybody lost? I'm a little lost with the multiplication. Why Why did you do that? Uh, just to remember it, you really don't need to multiply anything. Just to remember that both of them need to give you eight. So you don't pair CD4 with two, because four times two gives you what? Greater than eight, correct? You mean CDA with two, right? Right, yes. Wow, well, I did it backwards. So yeah, CDA times two. Yeah. So the product also always have to give you eight. You really don't need to multiply it. So just know that CD4 always goes with two, and CDA always goes with one. That's what you need to know. Okay. So okay. can you recognize? The C4 cell, sorry, go ahead. No, I just said okay, thank you. So when you bind the CD4, what are you looking for? You're looking for MAC2, correct? So yep. the CD4 is found in the T cell. So here's your T cell. 
which has CD4 cell. This is a antigen, and this is a macrophage that is presenting the antigen to the T cell. If it, if, if it presents an MHC2, then that means that that can be recognized, as you can see here, is presenting an MHC2. It can be recognized by the CD4 protein. So you see the binding here. And that's how the antigen presenting cell receptor, again, glycoprotein, proteoglycan, glycolipid, Receptor is able to bind to another receptor, glycoprotein, proteoglycan, glycolipid, on the T cell side, which is known as the CD4. Okay. So once you have a bound to these, then now you have activated your what? Your T helpers. So that means T helpers are active. Once you activate your T helpers, guys, what do you do? What is the role of a T helper? Guys, what's the role of a T helper? Ask for help. So the T helper is going to ask for help. It means it's going to release interleukins which are going to chemo attract more what? White blood cells, which is what? Either T's or B's. So far so good? Yeah. Yes. So active T helpers cytokines or chemotractic agents. These are going to stimulate more response and attract and stimulate macrophages, attract and stimulate cytotoxic T cells, and also promote activation of B cells. So in other words, it activates both Ts and Bs. Like we saw where? Let me go up. On the first slide, remember that we said the T helpers are able to do what? T and B cells. You remember that? Yeah. So once the T helpers, which are again CD4, are activated, they can activate both T cells and B cell end. So antigen presenting cells, class one or class two, which are the antigen presenting cells is a summary. The macrophages, the coffer, microbial, Langerhans, or dendritic cells. I'm gonna ask you mainly this one and this one. So what are the two groups of T lymphocytes membrane markers or receptors? CD8, CD4. Okay, so CDA binds to MHC ones, CD4 binds to MHC two. So it's a summary of what we talked about. So now the T helper activated in this case a B cell. Correct? We said that the CD4 was bound to the antigen presenting cell that had a MHC2. Remember? Yes. And then once it binds, then it's going to create an activation. Here, what it is. You normally have an inactive cell. Let's start here. Okay. So that's a plasma cell, 
inactive plasma cell. And then the cell is going to be sensitized. So what does that sensitize mean? Uh, they do not. So you have receptors on the cell, but it's not being activated. So some of those receptors may be recognizing the antigen, but they haven't been activated to clone themselves, to make more of the same. Because who does that activation? The T helper with the, the T helper that tells you that there is a problem. If not, it can be a minor infection and they will take care of its own. So when the T helpers in the, uh, intervene, that that is a, uh, I don't know, recognizable infection, let's, let's put that per se. So once that B cell is activated, then by the helper, of course, then you're able to do what? Your memory cells were inactive, but once you bind to the helper, what do you do? You clone it. What do you clone? You're cloning the one's receptors that were sensitized, or that B cell that had multiple receptors that were sensitized, or in this case, that bound to the antigen. So you go to the cloning, and then you create more plasma, and of course, more antibody production. Again, we're talking about the same thing over and over again. Are you guys following the process or not? No. Yeah. So enable for your B cells to go into clone, it needs to be activated by the T helper cells. Okay? If not, it's just simple what? Sensitization or sensitization. So what is in the antibody? We said that the B cells, B cells, in this case, plasma cells, produce antibodies. So what is the structure of those bunch of antibodies that are being produced? Well, the antibodies have, or they're divided into two major segments, a constant segment or a variable segment. So which is the one you think is going to change every time you get a different antigen? The constant or the variable segment? Variable. You got it. What is the variable made of? Protein? Glyco? Like sugar? Lipid? So that's what that molecule is changing. So it's changing to adapt so it can actually bind to the antigen uh, recognition site on the antigen end. Okay? So the variable segment is the one that changes. Now, on the constant segment, there are two things that you need to understand, and that is the binding of what? Complement. And the binding of what? Macrophages. So let me draw this. Hopefully, you understand it this way. This is, it gets a little confusing. I don't think it is. But imagine that you have a cell, OK? This is a cell, and these on the surface are your antigen. So this is your bacteria, and it has a bunch of antigens, correct? If you create an antibody that is able to recognize this end, okay? Say you have a couple of antibodies that are already there. That means that in the complement, I'm um, sorry, in the, in the constant segment, you're going to have a site where complement is going to bind, and where can macrophages bind. That means that if the macrophage did not recognize the antigen, it's going to do so now that is bound on the actual antibody. If the complement wasn't there, well, the complement now have a site where it can actually attach. It can glue itself. So now you have complement and macrophages helping 
what? Helping the antibodies destroy a single antigen. So in other words, everybody's collaborating. Is that clear? Yes. Repeat that again. OK. The reason why we're talking about the constant segment is because in there you have a complement binding and a macrophage binding. This allows for collaboration. Means the complement binds, the macrophage binds, and the antibody binds. All three are doing what? They're trying to kill the antigen. You guys get it? Yep. So it's yeah, not like yeah. one binds different to the other one. They all bind together. Okay. So far, so good. Yeah, so this structure that we're in the on screen, this is like that's what this is the the um here's the receptor on on the on the plasma, no? That is your antibody that was created by the plasma cell. Okay. So that antibody that is already sensitized, right? That was sensitized here, and you okay. make more of it, that antibody, that's the one that we're looking at here. This variable has already changed, and now right, this antibody but, is binding to the antigen. And that's just like at least it's like flowing on its own in the in, in the interstitial fluid in the lymph, right? Correct. Or, in the, in the okay. tissue, in all the tissues, yes. Okay. And that's just like and it binds the following two. And how does it and it receives the same chemical signals that everybody else receives for it to, it, um, to try to get to the antigen? Uh, normally what happens is that the, it is similar, yes. The plasma cells, which are the B cells, they release these antibodies near where the area of infection is. Okay. So if the infection takes place, most likely the infection is already in the blood, that's mm -hmm. going to run to it because it's floating in the bloodstream. Okay. And okay. so then the complement uh, the the binding, right along. I'm sorry, the constant segments, and so then they're they're just uh, they're working with the macrophages and the um, is it the uh, it's the macrophages and the yeah they work as anchoring. Let's put it this way: you have a truck, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know, you have the truck. And then you have a, a winch right here. I don't know, whatever that is to, to buy something else. So the first one, this, which is the antibody, this is the antibody. So you bind the first thing to the truck, which is what? Your complement. Okay. But that has another binding site. So now you mm -hmm. bind what? The macrophage. Right. Okay. So it's an anchoring mechanism that all it does is just amplifies the possibility of complement binding and macrophage binding. So, complement can bind directly to the receptors of this antigen or this bacteria. Mm -hmm. The macrophage can also recognize it, again, the antigen of the bacteria. So this is option one. That's what we talked about already. Okay. But if the antibodies bound or binds to this antigen, then this is your option two. Are you following? Okay. And how does that and how does that work also with the variable segment? Because the variable segment, all it is is that it's changed this. Okay, so imagine I'm going to do this. So variable segment, this one looks like that, two straight lines. The variable segment just changed, and it can be something like this. Or it changes, and it can be something like this. So now your antigen is a square, and now you're able to bind it. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. If your antigen changes to a circle, I don't know, some sort of a circle, then your, you know, the variable segment just goes like that and it's able to bind here. Okay. 
You get it? So mm -hmm. yeah. this variable segment, yeah, it's changing. It's the one that is adapting or is pining to the antigen shape. Okay. How many of you are confused, guys? So let me summarize this. We're talking about the antibody. So antibody has a variable that binds to the antigen, it's per se, and it has a constant segment. In the constant segment, you have two other ways to anchor complement and macrophage so they can help destroy the antigen, bacteria, viruses, whatever you want to call it. Okay. That's what we talked about. Last thing, disulfide bonds. What about it? Who cares? The book does. Okay. So the disulfide bond is what makes this structure so rigid. So the rigidity or the constant is made by this disulfide bond. Okay. Just let know what the function of the disulfide bond is on the antibody structure. Okay. So here's a table of the mechanism of antibody action. So you have the antigen, okay? You create the complex. Complex is the antibody binding to the antigen. Then what happens? It can either trigger or it can be do the following options. So it triggers a complement activation. Why? Because on the constant segment, you had a what? A macrophage binding site and a complement binding site. Remember? So it triggers a complement activation. The complement is going to bind to the surface and it's going to create something like this on the surface of the bacteria. So this is kind of like a hole that allows for content to get in and other content to get out. So in other words, you're getting a shotgun and you're shooting up close into a, I don't know, piece of, I don't know, whatever, uh, a piece of wood or a piece of carton. So you're making multiple holes all around the bacterial capsule. So what does that mean? Can you live with multiple holes in your body? No. Nope. It's gonna go outside. So this is going to kill the bacteria. That's on the complementary end. On the other end, you can trigger neutralization. What is neutralization? Well, here in the middle, you have your antigen. And now the antibodies are going to crowd it. They're going to crowd around the antigen. Uh, so that means that it's so crowded that is the antigen able to get inside a cell. If it's so crowded around and it's, you have, I don't know, 15 cops on top of one human being, would that person be able to move? No. No. So that's what neutralization means. It prevents the antigen, the virus, bacteria, toxin, for penetrating or doing any further damage in your body when they get a lot of wrong. The next thing event that happens is it may that may happen is agglutination. What is agglutination? You well, you guys know what agglutination is, right? On the ABO group. So that means that it binds. To the antigen on the surface, in this case, it will be a red blood cell, right? This is the ABO. So once it binds to the antigen, what do you think is going to happen? It's going to kill it. What do we call killing? Cellular lysis. Remember lysing? Yep. So that's what it is. So it can be agglutinated because why? Can, when we think about an antigen, we always think about it, what, a bacteria, viruses, or toxins? No. A blood, a piece of blood, right? A single red blood cell. 
it's an antigen too, as long as it's not part of you. So a foreign red blood cell. We can also elicit a precipitation event. What does that mean? If you bind to the antigen, and a lot of antibodies are binding to the antigen, each antibody has its own what? Weight. So the more antibodies you bind to the antigen, the more it's going to weight and the more that that is going to drop to the what? To the bottom. So make it less active or movable. Are you guys following? Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of like the, the yogurt. If you look, if you ever make yogurt or if you look at the yogurt or the cheese process, when you put a renin into the milk, which is a, you know, an enzyme that makes the protein agglutinate, so pump all the protein together, what sinks towards the bottom is the protein end. What rises on the top, which is that watery portion, is the one that is less dense. So the more dense tends to sink. That's what is happening. It's sinking. It's preventing it from moving. Okay? So this is, on all these events, are going to cause or increase the phagocytes to eat it and destroy it. Is going to be able to create an inflammatory process, and again, inflammation is mediated by the complement. So, inflammation complement. And if you have a bunch of holes created by the complement, then of course that cell is going to be killed because the content is going to go to the outside. So, that's known as cellular death or lysis of the cell through multiple uh, complement. Activation. Do we need to go over the different type of antibodies? IgG, IgG, IgD, M, or A. So A is a dimer. It's found in breast milk. IgM, the first antibody response. That is a pentamer. It has five arms. IgD is inactive, primarily is in the activation of B cells. IgE, this is the one that helps the release of histamines, so mediates inflammation and or allergic responses. And IgG, we said that that is 80% of your antibody. That is most likely against virus or bacteria. And this is going to be your member. So hopefully this is not new. This is something that we already no. So same thing, one by one. So one of the things that we're going to do today is know the difference between primary and secondary immune response. You already told me that the primary response was caused by what? IgM. You can see that here. And the secondary response is mainly mediated by whom? IgG, you can see that here. So what is the secondary response? The second time you get the same infective organism. Any questions? No. no. The end. So opening for questions, please let me know. Um, did B 